Jo, was geht, kleiner Cut. Ähm, ich bin mal wieder hier auf äh, Laser Gurkenland, dem Vanilla Anarchie Server. Ähm, eben einen Talk raussuchen. Äh, nein. Ja, dann let's go, wir schauen wie immer rein bei hier, hier, Knocking Drones offline. Ah, das ist hey, funny. Everyone, very much for coming. Dann schauen wir mal, wie es aussieht mit Speicherplatz. Ist noch ein bisschen was da. Mal kurz Discord-Nachrichten checken. Oh fuck, jetzt hat man den Link gesehen im Video, oder? Ich weiß nicht, wie lange dieser Link available ist, aber das ist ein Link von einer privaten äh, Diskussion. Äh, einfach nicht nachschauen. <lacht> ähm, ich trust euch doch, Boys. Okay, dann let's get up and running. God, this talk was fun to make and I'm glad it follows up the last one. Um, I have a few Some of the stuff that I present is a little different than the stuff that they talked about. So just to get a few things out of the way, a couple shout outs to some guys who helped me. Uh, some of them could be here, some of them couldn't. There's a few folks who wanted to be nameless, so their names were printed in black. So we're going to kick it off. <laughs> funny, funny. The hintergrund is black, by the way. And his oh. kid are just annoying snots, right? Insert your own four letter word. And God. And the problem is way too much discretionary spending because then all of a sudden one day this thing showed up and the kid is following it around all over the neighborhood and you can tell because he's crashing into every car every house every tree and he's running down the street with it and at night it's really obvious what he's doing because it just shows up and it's like really dude that's what the internet's for <laughs> and my initial response from all that stuff is hmm me take that you little bastard but if you were here in the last presentation they say shooting down drones is a problem and that's okay I don't want someone shooting down mine but this got me to think what if the following things were to show up such as maybe this. <laughs> yeah. Not hard to do. It's actually made the news. Some guys up in New England started mounting semi-automatic semi pistols to their homemade drone. That, interesting. What if this showed up? I can see the first shot being fairly accurate after that. It, no one's business. What would happen if this showed up? Yet not as cool. So I started looking around online and it turns out that there are a, bazill a bazillion regulations and everyone is trying to regulate unmanned aircraft systems, UAS, right? Which we call drones or quadcopters. And it turns out most of the regulations that are out there are not to restrict hobbyists. Most of them are there to restrict the government's use of quadcopters and drones. And there's a lot of attacking going on on the commercial space where you have to get certain FAA approval to fly. Um, 
and it turns out I was flying my DJI Phantom 3 while testing for this presentation over a parking lot, and I was watching it, and a guy came up right behind me, and he goes, hi, I'm actually from DHS's enforcement division for drones in the DC area. I'm like, uh, yeah. He goes, do you know what the rules are? Yeah. He goes, are you doing this for commercial use? And I said, no. He goes, okay, see ya. <laughs> and I followed him, and I wouldn't let him be. I'm like, hey, I got questions. He goes, dude, I have so many problems about guys flying those things around. And I said, well, what was your last problem? He said, a guy flew his quadcopter over National Stadium and lost it. <laughs> and I said, well, how did you ever find the guy? And he said, easy. Most of the guys who lose these things, you see them running over the hill with their controller. Have you seen that drone? Right? And I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, at which point we were waiting for him and we scooped him up. But it turns out that non-commercial use, hobbyist use of drones is largely not regulated. There are a few things that are out there, right? There are no flyer zones around Washington, D.C., and it centers around the White House and goes out 15 miles. There's actually supposed to be a no-fly zone of five miles around the airports unless you get permission. Apparently, the ceiling is supposed to be graduated. As you get closer, the ceiling goes down, but FAA tries, in some of the literature, just say five miles, that's it. It turns out you're not allowed to fly on military bases. That's considered bad. This came up in the last presentation. You are not allowed to launch or land from a national park. However, you are allowed to fly in their airspace. It is not theirs to regulate. However, they can cite you for reckless endangerment if it potentially could crash on someone. And they get people on that, and they confiscate the drone there. There was a guy out over the Grand Canyon filming some sunset. People complained. You know, this guy in the Smokey the Bear hat showed up. And, and took the guy away with his drone. Uh, there are temporary flight restrictions that are issued for disaster areas, wildfires, stadiums, large assemblies, and whenever there's going to be a presidential visit, and they do it several hours before and during the visit. Um, you are not allowed to mount a gun on a UAS because technically it becomes a weapon system. There is a 400-foot ceiling. Um, Amazon is now petitioning to try to get several hundred feet for themselves to deliver packages, and then they want a, a ban of 100 feet from everyone. Um, you also have to fly within line of sight, and I have it now counted up to 16 states who have now enacted their own laws. And technically, according to the guys I spoke to at DHS who do enforcement, a lot of that airspace is not theirs to restrict. Now, the five-mile area around airports essentially knocks out almost all of New York City, with the exception of a few parks. You're not allowed to fly above the sidewalks in New York City because of the reckless endangerment and safety issue, and then people get mad there. In the hobbyist area, um, there's a whole bunch of restrictions that come up, right? If you don't do it for commercial use, you're under 55 pounds, right? You're not interfering with any manned aircraft. You can be good to go. But that's nice and all, but most people don't know the rules because everyone and their brother is trying to create them. This is a listing of all the no-fly zones on the eastern side of the U.S. And damn, that's a lot of them. If you log into Parrot's website, this is a listing of all of the recordings that got automatically updated to their website that shows everyone who is flying on the eastern side of the U.S. Isn't that interesting? Over 2,000 flights in D.C., which is technically a no-fly area, and over 2,000 flights in New York City. Um, if you do a quick overlay of the maps, yeah, turns out people are flying in areas that they don't know about. And if they're smart, you know, I say it's interesting. And that's nice and all, but the rules are all there. But my neighbor's kid is still annoying, and I know he doesn't read. Right? And he's not getting the appropriate parental guidance. So it brought me up with the bigger question, is there any way to take that thing down? <laughs> graceful or ungraceful? I thought there might be a couple of ways. There's a couple. I can think of a few ways. 
but maybe something a little more subtle would suit our needs. So maybe the next time he's there, he doesn't capture video. Maybe it knocks it down and it flies away. And if you've ever seen this guy crash, he actually bounces like that. So let's take a quick look. I'm gonna take a look at two different drones, two of the more popular ones on the market. One is going to be the Parrot BMOX drone, which has a 1080p lens on the front. The other one's gonna be looking at the new DJI Phantom 3. And if we start by looking at the Parrot drone, we get a rough, list, a rough listing of the specs. And it turns out, sure, we got quad-core, we got memory, we got a top horizontal speed of 45 miles an hour. Wow. Right, Linux, but if you look really carefully at the specs, hmm. <coughs> the thing is, it's all flying router with DHCP enabled. Awesome. There's something else I found really interesting if you read the specs. It's got a really interesting GPS chip in there using American GPS and Russian-based GPS. So what happens if I muck with that, right? There's a couple other things that kick in. Uh, the free, the, <laughs> easy for me to say, the Free Flight 3 app uh, is installed on your Android device or your iOS device. You can get updates to that. If an update comes out, you don't have to forcibly install that update. You can ignore it. It doesn't come through the App Store. It actually is just sitting there. It checks their website so you can apply the update. A couple other things that are interesting, the return to home function. And I'm sitting here thinking, all right, if he's flying near me and I want to swap it and get it away, maybe I can take advantage of the return to home function and send that thing back home. The height distance thing is very interesting. If the thing is flying above 10 meters, it will fly back to its original return to home point. If it's flying less than 10 meters, the thing will automatically shoot up 30 feet turn, face home, and then fly home in a straight line. So if you have a house where you can pick up GPS and say you're in your living room with a ceiling fan, you may not want to hit the return to home feature because that gets very ugly fast. And that's how I lost my first drone. There's something else that I wanted to take a look at, and I see this in the documentation. If the VMOP drone loses connectivity with the controller for 30 seconds, this thing is supposed to fly home. Hmm. Hmm. That so jetzt habe ich die Hälfte vom Talk verpasst. Aber irgendwie scheint er wohl die Wi-Fi Dinge anzugreifen von der Drohne. Um, ja, let's go. I didn't use Darren Kitchens in Fusion, which is really cool. Actually, I didn't know that in Fusion existed at the time. But it's neat. There's an underlying Wi-Fi connection that gets established between the two devices, and then on top of that, the applications talk to one another. So let's introduce ourselves a little mischief, shall we? What happens if we de-off our original connection for, say, 30 seconds? It turns out the return the home function did not work correctly for me, and I did this like five times. I lost like six propellers at the time doing this test. Here's what it looked like when all of a sudden this thing gets de off for 30 seconds. It sits there and flies, point, it just landed. All of the rotors stopped at the same time and it went straight down. Maybe it got lost, maybe you thought that was going to be home, I don't know. But clearly that didn't work, so now I can just walk out to my property and pick the damn thing up. You want to take coming in. Maybe there's something else we can do. I got it. Let's give it a quick scan. And it turns out when you scan it with NMAP. <laughs> yep, it's a flying FTP server. Just floating around. Oh, that's awesome. I had 10 devices simultaneously connected to this guy. All at once, only one app was talking, but the other nine were sitting there waiting. We'll get back to that in a second. It turns out this thing is a flying FTP server, and there are two particular directories I found interesting. One was the media directory, where the little monster next door was filming videos, and the other was the thumbnail directory. 
no authentication was required to connect over FTP. I think that's fantastic. So I was sitting there and thinking, while it was in flight, maybe I can grab his pictures and replace them with something like that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was cool. All right, so I'll do it. I'm taking the videos you got of all the neighbors, but maybe I want to just see what they look like. <laughs> but then there's this monstrosity, Telnet, wide open, while the thing is flying, which kills me. So I tell that directly into the box. And here's a listing of the entire directory structure right there. Now, it's running, it's running BusyBox from like three years ago. Like this thing I purchased just a couple months ago for this presentation, and they never updated BusyBox. There have been something like 10 updates to BusyBox since this came out, but they haven't updated it. But I want you to look really carefully at three things for me. Take a look at those shell scripts sitting right there. So, <laughs> nice. I took drone number two. This gets to be a very expensive research project soon. He was hovering in my kitchen. I tell that directly to the box, and all of a sudden I see that. I'm like, that's pretty cool. So I wonder what happens if I type in this and hit enter. I am suddenly greeted with all of that. I was sitting there working in the kitchen, it was hovering, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> it out my stove. <laughs> I was thinking the shutdown feature would gracefully just shut down the motors and down it would go. <laughs> this thing, <laughs> there was no graceful shutdown. <laughs> it literally flew right by, and I'm like, wow. So if I was one of those cool dudes who got like carbon fiber blades, this is what it looks like in the park. It's flying, hit the command there. Point. <laughs> and down it goes. There is no restart from that. Oh my god, this is funny. Right? If you go look at some of the software exploits that are out there, it kills the running process and the thing fires back up. This is off. It's done. By the way, in case you missed it, because it always goes better in slow motion. Mm -hmm. If it's running near a wall, it gets up draft, and there's no telling where it's going to go. I was going to do that in here today. I fired this up this morning, and six wonderful conference attendees had connected to my open telnet connection. I'm not bitter, but you just feel my thunder. So there's another book. I mean, Shutting that thing down, great. So I had a coworker who looked at this and said, you know, that's not really epic. You should watch that thing like 400 feet in the air and crash it. And I'm like, well, give me your drone. <laughs> so why don't we just take the damn thing? Right? Kid, you knocked your ball into my yard. I'm going to take it. So we actually have two simultaneous connections to the same drone at the same time. If I am sitting there, and I, again, remember, I had like 10 devices all connected to it simultaneously. This is what it looks like from the iPad that is currently controlling the Bebop drone. It has access, it's hovering at one meter. I ran this inside a hotel lobby, they were not happy. This is what my iPhone sees. Okay. I'm connected to the network, but my app's not connecting. This is what we have. Hey, wait a second. Why don't I just send a quick D-off? The moment that D-off kicks in, the controller automatically says, I'm disconnecting right away. He is automatically having a bad day. So the question I have for you is, in this race condition, who's going to win? If he is running an iPad anywhere near indoors, he is going to pick up his home network or any other network before he picks up his Bebop drone connector, which I think is great. Which means 
he's going to sit there and try to reconnect even though his underlying network connection is not there and it's going to freeze. Meanwhile, on my iPhone, I've connected. I'm there. And I was sitting there and I connected because I do all think my Wi-Fi connection was good. Note the altitude list though on this. It now thinks that is zero. The thing was three feet in the air. So it didn't get an update for that, which means I'm off and running and now I am the guy who is in charge of that drone and he can't do anything about it. If I click the button at the top that says emergency, that thing just falls from the sky and the ways to go, which I think is great. One of the other things that kicks in with the free flight app that runs on top of the network connection, again, it, it's going to pair to any other network before it comes back to this particular drone, and I think that's fantastic. Now, for those little enthusiasts who have more money, the Bebop drone comes with an optional sky controller that looks like this. It's supposed to be a range accelerator. It turns out that that is its own wireless access point, too. And it's wide open, which means we can de off in one of two spots. If we de off between the iPad, which is literally just sitting in the cradle, it is not tethered, it's just sitting there connecting wirelessly. If I de off that and I connect my iPhone or my iPad to it, all of a sudden I get these little controller icons sitting right there, which means I have control of you. If I'm nice, I will temporarily send control back to your controller and then I'll steal it away from you. And I can go back and forth, which means he's going to respond all over the place, which means he's mine. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I think coding would be great, writing an exploit would be great, but the app is free. It's already been developed and tell us it's wide open. So what happens if we start looking around at other areas like GPS, right? And, and this is interesting because if you pull up the specs, there are several very specific frequency ranges used in the US and very several specific ranges used with the Russian GPS system. What if we screw with those signals? Now, there's one teeny tiny little problem with that. It's illegal. Like 18 different ways of illegal. Like you are currently fined sixteen thousand dollars okay. for every um, yeah, it's in Vita Zeit. Mach hier mal wieder einen Cut.